Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thank you so much for checking us out. As always, uh, you know what to do. Hit the subscribe button if you're digging what you see. Put out brand new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Great way to keep up with your, all of your favorite artists. And I got to tell you, one of my all-time favorite artists, who I also get to say he's a buddy of mine, Mike Doty. He's back. I'm in. What's doing, Kyle? How are you? I'm doing great, man. It's so great to see you. And you've got so much going on, as always. Yes. This time around, I should point out first, you, you've just released the second uh, book, which I wish I could say I've read yet. And it's I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, but I want to promote that at least. I die each time I hear the sound. But we're going to be talking about a brand new record under the band name of Ghost of Vroom. It's yes, Ghost you. of Vroom. It's me and uh, and Andrew Scrap Livingston, and it's sort of a vibe that uh, harkens back to soul coughing. Uh, in fact, I, I wrote this record and went to soul coughing and asked them if they wanted to do it, mm -hmm. and they said no. So, hence me and Scrap are ghost of room. Yeah, and and that that was brought up. So the last time you and I talked, it was about the anniversary of El Oso. Was one of the things yeah. we talked about, and you told me that that you had reached out to the guys. Yes. And, and it was even surprising to you that the one that you hit it off most with was Sebastian. It was the other two guys that it sort of fell apart, right? Yes. Yeah, so Sebastian and I are doing all right. Um, uh, but, uh, man, it was, uh, uh, you know, not to, like, go too dark, but it was crazy. Like, like it was a, you know, I mean, Soul Coughing was was one of the most uh literally insane bands uh of all time i think um and uh it it was just nuts it was it was just it was totally nuts and so that led to this record with ghost of room which uh, you know for, for those who don't know that stretches back to the uh, the debut record ruby room right so i guess i guess that's the question though why 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 go in that direction again what what brought that on what put you in this you know mind frame to do this music well i first should point out that ghost of room was a working title uh for a dub version of the first soul coughing album um we made ruby room and then my idea was that we would make the dub version ghost of room which was named after a um a, a burning spear album called garvey's ghost mm -hmm which was uh, the, the dub version of their album, uh, Marcus Garvey. Yeah, so, but then um, the, just a bunch of different threads came together. I was writing uh, upright bass lines, mostly because I was, I was writing on my phone on GarageBand, and the only sound I liked was the upright bass sound. Uh, then, um, so I do this Patreon thing where I do a new song every week. And, uh, you know, I'm just always started, you know, it's a, it's a lot of songs. So I'm always like fiending for new ways to approach a new song. And I just started looking up the old classic break beats, um, you know, and like, like ripping them off of uh, YouTube and looping them. And that was very foundational to soul coughing. Then uh, I'd been sort of messing around with some rappers, just jamming with them, like having them over in the studio and, you know, putting up beats and uh, listening to them. And uh, I uh, started like envying that, um, the adaptability of rapping. Um, and so I, you know, I'm not a rapper. I have, you know, I'm sort of like a Tom Waits influenced subterranean homesick blues influenced slam poetry plus you know early 90s hip-hop you know uh, uh a krs1 ripper offer fife fife dog ripper offer uh blendo um and so i started doing that again and um you know people started pointing out to me that what i was doing sounded like soul coughing um, so it was this uh, extremely organic um, uh, evolution into this thing. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't like um, I. I had a premeditated uh, drive to to go back into an old sound. I mean, I've I've never done that. I've always, you know, often much to the consternation of my audience, 
just gone after whatever I find most interesting in the moment. Yeah. And, and, but it does, it does harken back to that. I mean, all the stuff that you're saying, in, oh, yeah. music, I, um, you know, listening to it, it, it did get me thinking about the specific reasons why I loved soul coughing back then. And it was two oh. things that you brought up. It was the sample based thing uh, in the break beats, because that was something, you know, it was almost like a treasure hunt if you wanted to, even if you could never find what that obscure thing was, it was sort of right. still there. And the other thing was that jazz based thing. And you're talking about the upright, like, these are two things I do feel has not had a chance to have a resurgence. And I think it's a, it's a thing that the, the younger generation just has no clue. Like sampling means something completely different now. And the idea of putting jazz in a widely say alternative based music, like mm -hmm. that was cool as shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great sound. And we are unique in that Scrap actually plays a cello. Mm -hmm. and plays upright bass on a cello so it's sort of like sound it's the 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 sound is akin to the the weird like electric uh upright bass that was used on fania salsa records in the 70s mm -hmm. it's got more of like a like a funka funka than a boom 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 um and the songs are written idiomatically for the cello so they're all in c d and d sharp um but yeah, I mean, it's a, it, it's a beautiful sound, uh, you know, um, and uh, um, I, it's, you know, my, my, my favorite bass set. Yeah. So having Scrap do this, did, was it natural for him as it was for you? Did, was there conversation going, okay, we're, we are sort of doing this thing. I mean, did he have to follow your lead or was that just him doing his thing? That was just him doing his thing. I mean, the album is um, Gene Coy plays drums, uh, and I. Uh, but the rest is me and Scrap um, just going nuts on every instrument in Mario Caldado Jr.'s house, you know. And he has, you know, a bunch of different keyboards, and so, you know, uh, we put down, you know, the the bass and drums with a vocal. And then I do a guitar and then Scrap would do uh, like a Hammond B3 organ and then a piano. And then I would do some weird little machine laying around Mario's studio and then there'd be a clavinet. And so we just throw throw all this stuff in plus weird noises on uh, on the cello, which he does these kind of super high harmonic scratchy sounds that are super abstract and, and wonderful. And then I I got out a sampler and played it um you know it wasn't like looped uh samples it, you know play it sort of like a mellotron it's like mm. triggering sound effects yeah, um yeah oh you get so and the, the cool sounds like are all throughout these songs i i do notice also there's like there's so many of the songs that end with this completely other section it seems of music i guess yes that, like we so call what, them what's the going on? We call them the dreams, the dreams at the end of the songs. And every song has a dream. And this is going to be a Ghost of Room trademark. Um, what happened was after one song, Scrap was like, I wrote this like weird little imitation Chopin thing that has nothing to do with the song, but I want to put it at the end of Revelator. And so I was like, all right, check it out. And then we just did all these... Um, uh, one thing that we did is we, we, um, recorded a couple of spam voicemails. Mm -hmm. Like we record, we, like the one is, uh, on one of the songs is based around, um, a guy saying he's Donnie farmer from the IRS and that we have to call as soon as possible. Uh, then there's another one that we actually, to, to, it was in, uh, Mandarin and to translate it, we held one phone up to, the uh the google translate on another phone and it's this lady saying like you need to call the chinese consulate as soon as possible there's a problem with your passport um you know and there's other samples from weird places and um yeah so so e each song goes into this otherworldly place after the conclusion of the song part of the song Okay, so so you've sort of answered another one of my questions, and and it sounds like it's coincidence because when I started listening to it, you know, of course I'm kind of looking for, you know, some common threads, you know, tying the, and I started going, is there a government thing sort of happening here? Is there a, a 
the financial things sort of happening here. I mean, you've got the uh, the James uh, uh, James Jesus Angleton. Is, it, is that how you say it? Angleton. James yeah, Jesus Ang Angleton. Angleton. Yeah. And, and that just kind of backed up that whole, is there a thing happening here or was that just coincidence? Uh, I mean, certainly it's a politically fraught time to make uh, an, an album. Um, the last sound on the album is a voice um, uh looped backwards doing a a segment of um the the wb yates poem the second coming which is about the apocalypse um james jesus angleton is about the the head of the cia uh in the 60s um yeah and then we got our man donnie farmer from the irs so yeah <laughs> I, guess, I guess there's there's all kinds of apocalyptic financial political themes in there the apocalypse this is something that a lot of artists are kind of looking to. I, I found that you know for artists who are writing about sort of in this kind of reflection i should say it's either apocalyptic or they're just writing about space like let me get as far away as possible <laughs> you know that seems to be the thing hey man it's uh i i, I gotta write some songs about space i guess i, I feel like i'm <laughs> behind the curve Bridgem, apocalyptic space. I don't think anyone's exactly there done that go. one yet. There you so. go. It's time. Well, I actually wrote a, a a rock opera based on the Book of Revelation that I staged for uh, WNYC in New York like five years ago. And there's a song called Revelator on mm -hmm. uh, on the album that uses some um, like apocalyptic lines from gospel songs and uses some actual scripture from St. James, from the, you know, the, the, um, the King James, uh, translation of, of the book of revelation. Um, so I, you know, I, I mean, I guess it begins with iron maiden when I was in middle school, but I've always been fascinated with, uh, the biblical apocalypse. Yeah. And that song too. I mean, you don't do, it's not a cover John, the revelator, but that's, I mean, lots of musicians have tackled that. Uh, yes yeah know, yeah yeah good years so so what you did to it was completely unique i mean could you talk a little bit more about that one specifically because it is a high point for me on the record oh thank you um yeah i, I mean um i i've been trying to so i'm gonna do another version of revelation at some point um and it's gonna be there's gonna be more songs so i started working on uh you know more a more songy song for the rock opera um and that's what it turned out to be and since it's a very it's very general and doesn't fit into like a specific place in the narrative of revelation um i brought it to ghost of room yeah well it's it's one of those moments in there that among many, I, you know, like um, more bacon than the pan can handle. Uh, <laughs> yes. now, I've heard that one before this record. I don't know if you did that live or did. I mean, why have I heard that? I Because that's been out there. I, yeah, I used the sample on a song uh, on um, uh, Yes and Also Yes. No, okay. on Golden Delicious. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's where it comes from. That's yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, God, there's southern culture had too much pork for just one fork and i'm pretty sure that's the uh, the marriage <laughs> of songs right there <laughs> yeah there you go as you're looking back and and again in in the way that you are and i don't want to paint it that this is a nostalgic record because it is not um but as we you kind of find those parallels between this and and the old version of uh, of what you did in soul coughing what did that mean lyrically because like you've talked about it before you had this amazing poetry teacher uh that you learned yes Seku Sundiata was my poetry teacher when I was uh oh gosh 19 years old going to the new school in New York and uh he was just all about being the most authentic version of yourself um and you know gosh that sounds a bit live laugh love uh when I put it that way but um it was about it was about finding something uh you know in your core um and and to find a style that you could kind of articulate um and that would be unmistakably yourself mm -hmm. you know and he also was he also was all about stealing conversely he was like steal everything steal what you want um in the same uh poetry class ani defranco was 
was uh, my co-student in there. Mm. Um, and so he's, he's an influential guy. Um, he, uh, you know, he certainly changed my life. Yeah. But it, it, do you credit him with giving you your unique style of lyrics? Because there's no, you, no one else sounds like, has ever sounded like what you do exactly. <laughs> Well, like, he credit. Like he... I wish I should say there's. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. There, there's like the Beastie Boys over here and Beck over here, but none of the three of you sound like each other. That's about the right. only two other artists that I would put anywhere in the camp of what you do, though. Right. I mean, uh, he. I guess he encouraged me to be as weird as possible, and uh, you know, I mean, I guess I was sounding very much like my influences. Um, I mean, he, uh, he he never would have used the word, and I hate the word, but he w was kind of about having a brand, mm -hmm. um, you know. And so for me, it was like, you know, uh, kind of Alan Dugan plus rappers plus Raymond Chandler, kind of noir stuff, Tom Waits, and synthesizing that into something that was... Uh, you know, I mean, I'm I very much listen to uh, rock music and it all sounds like nonsense to me. So like going directly into super bizarre sound poetry nonsense did not seem that weird to me. But everybody, um, you know, I mean, I half the rock songs of the 90s. Um, I mean, my my favorite line is. I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now. <laughs> and, you know, it's like the, nobody questioned that guy uh, about, about, you know, being nonsensical. And somehow my thing was, was uh, seen as like this super arty avant-garde, you know, noise poetry vibe. But it came around at such the perfect time. I've been looking back specifically at a point in the early 90s from the early 90s to that mid 90s point where the culture of weird just exploded yes you know, it, it exploded in all types of art you know animation i've got red and stimpy behind me over here that was one uh -huh. of the great things and what happened with you know nighttime on places like mtv and all that but the music too just like what it would have been compared to before I, that's what i'm using weird you know as the as the pedestal on and and this certainly fit into that were you aware of that? Did it feel like at, at the time, like, hey, man, you know, lunatics in the asylum, you know, all of that? I mean, I I was, I mean, I, I wasn't arrogant. I was just stupid enough to think that people in the mainstream would want to listen to this. And it never it never occurred to me that that this was kind of too, you know, edgy or, you know, out of left field. So I just pursued it as if I was making uh, pop records. And, um, you know, it was, you know, it was a time in which, like, remember the squirrel nut zippers? Mm -hmm, they were like, like a Duke Ellington-esque, like, you know, like, uh, like jungle swing band, like sort of circa 1935 band. And they had a huge hit. And uh, even like, even like living la vida loca i mean mm. what a weird thing with the spy guitar and the you know like that kind of stuff um to you know presidents of the united states of america and back and um you know it i i sort of stumbled into an extremely fertile time for weirdness without considering how lucky i was yeah um, and I guess these days I'm not trying to be weird, but I am trying to be different from everything else. Right. You know, so like everything is really in tune. I try and be really out of tune. You know, everything is really smooth. I try to be really rough. Um, you know, like I, I just, you know, I, I probably would own a larger home. If uh, if I, you know, paid more attention to being like things than being unlike things. But whenever I hear stuff, I just, you know, even if I love it, I, I just said, like, I want to be completely different from that. <laughs> what can I do to be, you know, like, yeah, uh, you know, not uh, what is it? WWJD. What would Jesus do? But WWNED. What would nobody else do? <laughs> 
<laughs> it served you really well. It served you. Yeah, well. It, yeah, it has. Yeah, I'm the only professional me that I'm aware of. <laughs> Is is that the title? Is that the headline right there of the? Yeah, uh, there. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You know, me. Um, I will point out as we as we talk about that stuff from the nineties, just because it's the anniversary year, and that's what I like to do. It's the twenty fifth of Irresistible Bliss this year. Yeah, that's right. It is. So it I don't is. know if you, of course, you know, touring is out the window, and that's what you've done through most of this stuff. But but you have been able to celebrate uh, the other records in, in that way. Is there any way that you sort of tie that into what you're doing here? Because we point out Ruby Vroom was great. It set the stage. Irresistible Bliss looked like the explosion happened, you know, with, with songs like Super Bon Bon. So what? Yeah, I mean, it had, it had, it had the, the, the radio hit on it, you know, which is which comes back periodically. It was in that Michael Jordan documentary. Right. Um, I forgot that, that yeah. was true. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the, I guess, the cornerstones of, of um, what I do for a living, you know? Yeah, you end up naming a, a greatest, what is it, a re-recording greatest hits off of it, right? So it yeah, well, Circle so, Super Bomb Bond, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I was just, um, for that, I, I was just, I was going to do a tour of all Soul Comic songs because mm-hmm. I hadn't played any in about a decade. Mm-hmm. And um, I talked to my agent and he was like, to do a tour, you really need to put something out you know, as like a flyer for the tour. You know, there has to be some kind of album release. So I did a crowdfunding campaign to to get money to do the album and the crowdfunding campaign just exploded, um, which is how I think there's a couple of things on that album that are amazing. I think um, the ha- version of How Many Cans mm. um, and the version of uh, of um, uh, Sleepless, I think mm. I think those are really great. So if I could redo that album, it would be a 45 right um but you know I, 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 you know i called it the name of the album was circle super bomb on st louis a list of the 13 songs on the album because <laughs> you know i i didn't want it to be mike doty sings the 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 you know the all-time best of soul coughing or whatever right, right. uh which I, I do have around here somewhere well it's out of reach unfortunately i do have this back here i should have shown this at the beginning of it this is oh uh, yeah this is there what you go. Looking at with the ghost of room right here it, yep which, you know, I hear the axe wing. And by the way, one of the coolest sounding songs uh, every oh. single time it comes on WFBK. I love that. And I also want to ask really quickly about another song on here while I'm thinking about it. What does Beat Up Born mean? Oh, I don't know. Beat Up Born, where I come from. Um, I, I, it's one of, like, I write a lot of things that I, I, I put in, like, sort of filler words. You know, like rather than, you know, some singers do like blah, blah, na, na, la, la, whatever. But I put like actual words in there, you know, and sort of figure out what the, you know, what the weird little kind of half melody things I'm doing sounds like. And sometimes it sticks and there's just no sensible alternative to the nonsense version. And that's that's one of them. Well, you've created some kind of phrase that I'm going to figure out how to use one way or the other. So it's... please do. Please, man. <laughs> you know, I'm such a big fan of what you do. It's so awesome to hear this music that you're doing here. It's very exciting. It's very not like what anybody else is doing. So you did it. Congratulations. There you go. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm fucking like old man. Sorry about the curse. Uh, you know, old man just being as weird as he possibly can. Yeah, Keep doing that, please. I will. Indeed, I will. I mean, I got the, the the next ones written and we're going in with Mario as soon as uh, as everybody's got their their double jab done. Um, you know, we're doing the exact same thing. You know, I had a prolific pandemic. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I look forward to hearing that, too. Mike, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kyle. Appreciate it.